moved. So we're going to read from Matthew chapter 7, 1 to 5. Get ready. This one's fun. Ready? Do not judge others, and you will not be judged. For you will be treated as you treat others. The standard you use in judging is the standard by which you will be judged. And why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? How can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get rid of that speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye? Hypocrite, first get rid of the log in your own eye, and then you will see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. so blessed to be together today, and we are especially blessed to be together under the leadership of Tim and the words that he has to share with us. Lord, I pray for that inner strength that you grant us. I especially pray for the inner strength that you give to Tim, and I pray over this message and that we receive it with words of, receive it with words of wisdom and we abide by what we hear. Be with Tim, dear Lord. Amen. Amen. All right, so we're in a teaching series. We're calling When Jesus Asks, and we're just looking at some of the questions Jesus asked, which he asked a lot of them. One of the things we've invited you to do is take this opportunity during these next summer months to read through one of the Gospels and maybe pay attention to some of the questions Jesus asked. He asks uh, over 300 of them when you combine them in the Gospels. Obviously, some of them would be repeated from Gospel to Gospel. Um, but one of the things about questions is they, they just make us pause sometimes. They make us think. So sometimes somebody will ask a question, and you'll be like, I've never thought of that. And I think that's one of the ways Jesus uses the question. Sometimes they get at your motives, like, why, why did you ask that, or why did you say that? And you're like, come to think of it, I don't really know. And, and so questions are helpful just to diagnose those kinds of things. And sometimes questions just stop us in our tracks, and then we carry them with us. You know, somebody asks a question, and you just say, I don't, I'm not sure how to answer that one. But then it sticks with you, right? You, you take that one away. So Jesus asks these kinds of questions. He asks them often, and he asks them well. And so what we're going to be doing during the summer is just taking some of these questions and unpacking them a little bit to pause and consider, like, what was the value of that question? What was Jesus getting at? Why was he using that question with that person? Um, and then finding some application for our own lives. And so that's what we're going to be doing in our time in the summer together. We did two of them already, and then we took a break for our celebration Sunday last Sunday, and then we're back at it today. And so today, we just read a passage, and we're we're, we're looking at one of the most popular, often quoted lines by those outside the church. A and I don't mean to say this flippantly. It's just those who, who like stand against what, what you believe as a Christian or those who have deconstructed their faith um, or those who, who just want you to go away and leave them alone. And m many people will treat this like, this, this, right here, this is the summary, pretty much, of what Jesus meant when he came. Do not judge. And so it, it tends to be used like a walk-away statement, right? Like, and when it's referred to biblically from somebody outside the church, it's often used in a little bit of a snarky attitude. Like, doesn't the Bible say do not judge, and it's kind of lobbed into the conversation like a grenade, and when you try to talk about something, they're like, well, doesn't the Bible say do not judge? Boom. <laughs> you know, what are, now what are you going to say? And, and so while it is uh, a favorite verse of people outside the church, interestingly, maybe the contrast is it is probably not referred to enough by those of us inside the church. 
So while it's easy for us to say, yeah, why do you keep doing that? I think the point Jesus is making is there's something for you to see here. And so I, I think we would do well to give more attention to this idea of not judging. I don't know if you're familiar with a, a Barna Research Group. Anybody? Yeah, nobody. Oh, wait, we got two. So Barna Research Group, it's a Christian polling research organization. And kind of what they do is, is they talk to Christians um, and they kind of find out what do Christians believe uh, about the Bible? How much do they hold to be true? How do they live that out? So that's one of the things Barna does. The other things Barna does is they talk to people who would say, I am not a Christian. And they ask them, like, what's your perception of Christians? What's your perception of faith? What's your perception of the Bible? And so they get a lot of interesting things about what Christians think about Christians and the Bible and church and what non-Christians think about Christians and the Bible and the church. So about 10 years ago, there was a survey where Barna asked uh, thousands of people, I think it was close to a 10,000 sampling, um, and one of the questions was, one of the requests was, choose some words to describe Christians you know. And as you can imagine, it was all great words. No, it wasn't. <laughs> so, top two words. First one, judgmental. Second one, hypocritical. So judgmental, meaning you look down on people who have different moral values or ideas than you. Hypocritical, meaning and you don't live up to the moral values that you point to other people and say they're missing it. So, well, it's not a flattering look for Christians, right? Like that's the top two words that they came up to describe Christians. And so let, let's just acknowledge right up front, there are reasons that people have those views. There are things that we do and say and communicate that leave people with those views. But, but here's what's interesting. So you, you hear that research from Barna and that say the top two descriptors of Christians are judgmental and hypocritical. And so like one of the questions we wind up asking is, so who is that talking about? Let's put it in the room here. And let's just ask it really specifically. Are you judgmental and hypocritical? Now, most of us would say, I, I don't think I am. So let's broaden it out. Do you feel like most of the Christians you know are judgmental and hypocritical? Now, you can point to some, right? We can all say, um, but I, I can name a couple names for you. But I think many of us, by and large, would say, I don't feel like most of the Christians I know are like that. So that leaves us trying to figure out, like, who, who exactly are we talking about? So if, if we don't think it's me and we don't think it's most of the people I know, then who are we talking about when, or who are they talking about when they say Christians are judgmental and hypocritical? So let's talk about that for a second. So a number of years ago, I, I don't even remember the name of the church. There was a small, vocal, obnoxious church that would show up at all kinds of public events, and they would have signs, and they would be shouting, and their signs would say things like, God hates fags, you're going to hell. And they would show up outside arenas, and they would show up at political events and concerts and all kinds of things. And, of course, they got all kinds of headlines, and they made the news, and people would interview them and tell us why you hate so much. And, and so, like, they're the kind of people, like, okay, so that's part of who that survey is talking about, like, those people right there. And here's the thing, like, most of us as Christians had no respect for what they were doing. Like, nothing they did reflected grace, nothing reflected love, kindness, grace, hope, or the gospel. They're just shouting at people and condemning them. And so, like, we would look at them. Uh, okay, let, let's do, I'll speak for me. I don't know how you looked at them. But I'm like, a bunch of idiot yahoos ignore them. 
So time out. What did I just do? Uh, see how tricky this one gets? <laughs> this is why we've got something to talk about. Which, by the way, same thing happens when somebody outside the church says you're hypocritical and judgmental. What do they just do? They just judge you. And this is the tricky thing about judgment. That somehow we all feel like that's not me, that's you. And so we, we can point to somebody else and judge and totally miss that we're doing the same thing. When you've been judged, you know it right away, don't you? Like, say, hey, stop that. You're judging me. You don't know me. But when we do it, we don't see it. This is the attitude Jesus is addressing. See, kind of our approach to judging, and this is, when I say are, like this is a human problem, not a Christian problem. Being hypocritical and judgmental is not just a Christian thing, it's a human thing. And so, so part of our problem is this. It doesn't really count as judging if I'm right. <laughs> Honestly, that's how we approach it. That's how everybody approaches it. Listen, if you're ignorant and stupid, I can say that <laughs> because I'm right. That's not judging, that's just telling you the truth. And listen, this is how we all treat it, Christians and non-Christians. Like, well, that didn't count as judgment because they are ignorant and stupid. And when they come to us, like, well, that didn't count because they are ignorant and stupid. And this is the problem with judging, and this is why we've got something to talk about. And this is what Jesus is addressing right here. This becomes a little bit of a tricky thing. And this is why we need to talk about it. So today's question from Matthew chapter 7 is like this interesting tiny little parable wrapped in a question. And Jesus paints this picture that's, well, it's easy to see and almost silly and goofy. Like, I don't know if you've ever thought of Jesus having a sense of humor, but there's no way you use this illustration without being like, yeah, it's really dumb, isn't it? But you get what I'm talking about. Like, this is silly. And the question has to do with hypocrisy and judging others. And so Jesus highlights the silliness, even the audacity of trying to speak to the issues in somebody else's life while being blissfully blind to the issues in your own. And so he asks this question, why worry about speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own. So picture how ridiculous what he's just saying is. So somebody's got a little speck, right? And you're like, that looks miserable. Like, does that speck bother you? Because like that hurts me looking at it. Like, this is what Jesus is getting at. Like, how silly it would be is he's creating this ridiculous. Like, you can't actually have a log in your eye. It's not even possible. But what he's saying is, like, you guys miss the obvious. You're swinging a beam around coming out of your eye, and you're like, oh, that speck looks miserable. And this is what Jesus is pointing out. He, he's like, do not judge others, and you won't be judged. Here's how it says in the... the message, so this is a paraphrase, Eugene Peterson's paraphrase, so it's not a direct translation, but he's putting it into his own words, and he says it like this, don't pick on people, don't jump on their failures, don't criticize their faults, unless, of course, you want the same treatment, and then listen to how he puts verse 2, the critical spirit has a way of boomeranging. Back to Jesus' question. So why worry about a speck in your friend's eye when you have a log in your own? How can you think of saying to your friend, let me help you get that speck in your eye when you can't see past the log in your own eye? Hypocrite. First, get rid of the log. Then you'll see well enough to deal with the speck in your friend's eye. 
So the first thing to notice about Jesus' commentary on judging others is I want you to notice the direction of the focus. So judging goes from me out, right? So I've made some assessments, some judgments about you, and I'm going to tell you about that. Jesus flips it around and says, look in the mirror. So it, here's how I started thinking of it this week. Like how, how we think of this verse, do not judge me. So picture wearing a teacher, uh, a t-shirt, right? You've got a t-shirt, and your t-shirt says in big letters, do not judge me. Okay, that's not what this is saying. In fact, if you're going to wear a t-shirt that fits this, your t-shirt is going to say, I will not judge you. See the difference? So when we use this verse, we typically throw it at somebody. Don't judge me. And Jesus is saying, that's actually not the point. The point is, you take care of you. So I actually can't stop anybody from judging me. But I do have full control over whether I judge people. That's what Jesus is getting at. So don't be the judgmental hypocrite who's always pointing at the flaws of others. Again, not just a Christian problem, it's a human problem. And this is what Jesus is getting at. So he says, do not judge others. And again, like we come to this and say, you can't do that, you can't judge. And we use it to silence anybody, like back off, that's not your place. And it clearly does, Jesus uses those words, right? Do not judge others. The universal application that people take from this is you can't comment on anybody else's life. You can't have an opinion on anybody else's actions. And if you do, you are not like Jesus. So here's the question. Is Jesus really saying you can never, ever judge? Literally, the word judge means to come to a conclusion or a decision. That's what it means. So, a teacher grading a test has to come to a conclusion or a decision that that's an A, B, C, D, or F, right? But Jesus just said you can't do that. Or a coach selects players to be on the team and some who are left off the team. Sorry, Jesus said you can't do that. Everybody's on the team. Or a company who interviews employees. Oh, sorry, you got to hire everybody? You can't pick anybody. Jesus said no. And <coughs> college students. Like you apply to a college and they, some get in, some... You, sorry, Jesus said you have to take everybody. Like, like you kind of see how it breaks down pretty quickly. Like that can't be what he means. And actually just follow Jesus further down into the context and you'll see that's definitely not what he means because later in the chapter, Jesus talks about a tree and its fruit and he, he uses it to illustrate false prophets and true prophets and teachers and that you can tell them by their fruit. Well, the very nature of what Jesus is saying is there's true ones and false ones and I want you to know the difference. What do you have to do to do that? You got to judge. And, and here's the thing, like we make judgments every day and they're valuable sometimes. Like we make decisions that involve other people. We make assessments about speech and attitude and work ethic and productivity. We make judgments about dependability and reliability. We make judgments about guilt or innocence. We make judgments about whose version of a story we believed. We have to make a judgment. We have to judge on appearance and behavior. And we can mess all of that up. But I think we'd all agree, if you take that out, like, it's chaos. When I was a, a pastor just outside Detroit, there was a guy who had come into the church who had mental illness. And, and so he wasn't a scary guy in any way. He was an innocent guy. He was there all the time. He came in, and you'd talk to me in my office, and I'd try to make sense of what he was saying. Didn't always make sense. Um, but there's one night where, where he came in. It was just me left at the church. It was, I don't know, maybe six in the evening. And he came in, and like something was not right. 
I had never once in my life in all my interaction been fearful of this guy. And all I could think is, okay, I need to get out of here. And, and so I wrapped up the conversation, and, and it was, I never felt like that again with him. But I made a judgment, like something's not right. And I would contend, like, there's value in making those judgments. So I don't think Jesus means you can't judge. It doesn't make sense, even in terms of Scripture, what he says to do. And it doesn't make sense just in real life. It doesn't work. You can't just never judge. You have to make decisions like this. And so you take this passage, and if it doesn't mean just don't judge, then what are we talking about? What does this mean? And, and to kind of like make this clear, here's what I want to do. So this is part of the Sermon on the Mount, and the Sermon on the Mount starts with the Beatitudes. Many of you are familiar with the Beatitudes. So let's lay one of the Beatitudes side by side with this statement. So here's one of the Beatitudes. It says, blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. And now put that next to the verse we're looking at now. Same Sermon on the Mount. Do not judge, or you too will be judged. For in the same way you judge others, you will be judged, and with the measure you use, it will be measured to you. When you look at them side by side, they almost seem like the flip opposite of the other, don't they? Like, one approach is mercy, and one approach is judgment. You got these two very different attitudes, and we all know what it's like to be on both sides, like to receive mercy and how that feels, and to be judged and how that feels. Two very different ways to see people. One is condemning and critical. The other is gracious and kind. We know the difference. Look at verse, verses 1 and 2 in Matthew 7 again, and I want you to notice. So here's what it says, Do not judge or we will be judged, for in the same way you judge. Notice the words, the same way. Because here's what we, we get to notice now. It's not that all judging is wrong, but the way you do this matters. The way you go about this matters. That we can come with this wrong attitude, this wrong approach that lies behind so much of, of the judging and the fault finding that there's a very critical aspect. And I think when, when people say Christians are judgmental, they're addressing the way we go about things. Judging is not just an action, it's an attitude. It's not just about what you do, it's about how you do it. And so when Jesus speaks against judging in this context, I think what he's talking about is, so listen, lose the holier-than-thou attitude. Don't make hasty, unloving decisions about people. Don't be graceless. Don't be a fault finder. Don't be critical. And by the way, almost every time we do that, there does, it does include some sense of superiority. Like, I'm up here, and you're down there, so let me just speak to you from up here about what I see down there. That's the idea of judging. Like, the way that comes across is immediately offensive. When it's done to you, right? When somebody's like, I'm up here, you're down here, let me tell you about your mess down there. How many of you are like, oh, that was really helpful, thank you. <laughs> like, most of us are like, get out of my face, and I'll be gone, thank you. A and so, so this is what Jesus is talking about. Like, there's a way you do this that is messy and leaves people feeling like they just got messed with. He's warning us to take serious, to take seriously this idea of like, so examine yourself. Like we're so good at examining other people and saying, mm, okay, so here's what you could work on. And Jesus is saying, how about this? Look in the mirror and be like, mm, okay, so here's what you could work on. How about that? There was a church in Portland, Oregon that kind of had this, this tagline or this approach to how they 
built relationships with people and how they spoke to them about truth. And their, their phrase was this, truth requires a bridge. And so kind of like one of the ways to understand that, so if you feel like somebody needs a truckload of truth in their lives, well, then you need to build a bridge that can hold that truckload of truth. Does that make sense? Like establish safety and credibility in such a way that you can speak to that and that they'll listen. There are occasions, right, where somebody has spoken to you who knows nothing about you and they said something like, okay, that one hit and I, I received it. But by and large, if somebody doesn't know you and tries to hit you with some truth, by and large, we dismiss it. We hear it when somebody we believe knows, loves, and cares about us says it. Even then, it's a little touchy. But we can receive it in that context. So let me take you to an interesting verse. I almost didn't do this because we can get lost here, but it's just, we're going to go here. Matthew 7, 6. I know you've read this one, and you'd be like, I have no idea what that means. It says this. I don't know if I, did I put, oh, good, good. Do not give dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Everybody got it? <laughs> How many have ever read that one? Like, I have no idea. And so let me just be clear here. There are all kinds of different views on what that means. So one of the ways that, that I would approach this is like we try to figure out, so who are the pigs and who are the dogs and what are the pearls and the scraps and, you know, why are they trampling? And so, I mean, that's, that's like an allegory, like everything kind of has a meaning. And then there's a parable, which is one point. And, and I think if we treat it like a parable, it's much clearer. And the simple idea is this. Dogs don't care about sacred things. And pigs don't care about pearls. So you may see pearls as very valuable and offer them to a pig, and the pig's like, who cares? So uh, let me describe it this way. Our dog, Oslo, he loves cheese. I could do anything for cheese. If, if he's out somewhere on the property and say, Oslo, come get cheese, he'll come from wherever he is, and he'll come from a piece of cheese. So he, he loves his cheese. That's his love language. Like, that's how you meet Oslo where he is, is you offer him cheese. Now, I could have some valuable pearls and be like, Oslo, you want a pearl? <laughs> and he'd come up and sniff it. If it's anything like cheese, I might. But if it's not, no. And, and the idea that I want us to catch here, and I think this is what Jesus is getting at, is... Like the way we approach things, like we have this, this truth or this conviction that we feel like is valuable, but they don't. And so we try to put it in front of, the, front of them, and then we're shocked when they're like, yeah, not interested, and they trample it. And even worse, turn on you and be like, who do you think you are? And I think that's what Jesus is getting at. Like when you put it in the context and just simplify it, it's like, so why don't you think away about the way you approach people? If they don't value what you value, then start somewhere where you can relate to them, where you can connect, and maybe you can build that relational bridge to get there. So that brings us to this parable wrapped in the question as we, we finish up here. So why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own? Right? And again, it's that silly, exaggerated thing, like you got this this beam sticking out of your eye and you're focused on their speck like, wow. Like I had a speck in my eye one time and I know how bad that hurts, so I don't even know how you're doing this right now. And like Jesus is saying, and yet you've got it, a beam. And you don't even know it. You don't even see it. And, and so here's the sort of absurdness of it all and kind of the, the take home for you. Like when you feel critical of somebody, when you want to judge somebody, you should always assume that you may not be seeing clearly. 
at the very least, you don't know the whole thing. The idea is that we shouldn't just jump to conclusions and assume. So how often do you assume you know the motives of that person? I mean, like, I barely even know what my motives are. How do I know theirs? Like, but we assume we know what somebody else's motives are. We assume that's how they always are. What I just saw there, you're always like that. I know it. Do you know that? How could you possibly know that? Have you ever been in a store and somebody like kind of lashes out? I remember being in a store one time and somebody was mad because they had to wait and they had a pocket full of change and they whipped it on the ground. I'm like, that is a jerk right there. <laughs> but here's the thing. You don't know what went into that person's life just coming into that store. You don't know what the story is. You don't know about their brokenness. You don't know about their motives. You don't know what wrestling is going on in their hearts. You don't know what events have played out in their lives. You don't know what happened that morning. And yet, we place judgment. Like that guy throws change in every store. I'm sure of it. Possibly, but also possibly not. So here's the risk that we're warned about. Like, just don't make assumptions. So when somebody judges you, and you know what that feels like, and they saw you in a moment, is it fair to say that's what they're always like? It's probably not. In fact, if you confront me, I may just tell you the story. Doesn't mean it's okay. Doesn't mean that what I did is, is right. Doesn't even justify it. But it does tell you there's context. And context may not make what I did okay, but here's what context does do. It allows me a little bit of room for grace. And that's what we need. See, when I give you context, what I'm trying to do is help you understand like there's room for grace here. Yes, what you just saw was not my best moment, but can I share context with you? And what I'm trying to do is invite you in with a little bit of grace instead of judgment, like that's who you are all the time, every time. In fact, Jesus makes it clear in verse five that there is something to helping people with specks in their eyes. I mean, he, he says it like this. First, remove the beam from your eye. Then, help them with the speck in their eye. So there are times and places for us to help with specks. But just, there's work to be done first. Clear your own vision. So when you're tempted to speak about the speck in someone's eye, let me give you some questions that you might ask to diagnose whether this is the right thing to do. So first, here's the big one. Are you the kind of person who looks around the room and sees lots of specks in lots of people's eyes? Basically, are you an overly critical person? So if you are, you should probably back out of most of these opportunities because you have a leaning that way that probably is going to exclude a lot of grace. Here's some other questions. I think they're up here. Some of those here. So, is it your honest desire to help this person? Like, if you're going to bring something up, is it your honest desire to help them? Now, again, we can get into weird, fuzzy motives like, yes, I want to help them after I punch them. <laughs> but is it your honest desire to help? Second one, is there some satisfaction in you telling them this? Follow that up with, do you have an unusually strong desire to point this out for them? Like, I'm waiting for the right opportunity to get you with this one. So if, if any of these three, if you're not really wanting to help the person, if there is some satisfaction in judging them, if you find yourself with an unusually strong desire, all of those would say, 
probably don't do that. You're not the one to, to make this statement. A couple other questions. Do you genuinely care about this person? And some ways to think about this. Can you say anything nice about the person? Like, if you can only name critical things and nothing positive, maybe you're not the right person here. Do you feel like you hold some moral high ground? It's a hard one. Because remember we started with, I mean, if I'm right, then I can just say this. But there's a moral high ground, like, I'm here, you're there. So if there's any sense of, I'm here, you're there, probably step away. And then, it, here's a good one. Are you the right person to point out this issue? This is a huge one. So many times, you're not the right person. There are right people to talk about things in our lives. But they're people who have the relational bridge, right? That can hold that truth. We all instinctively understand the difference between someone who loves you and cares about you and someone who's just being critical. Uh, one commentator, John Stott, writes this, the command to judge is not a requirement to be blind, but rather a plea to be gracious. Once more, there's a time and a place to speak to the stuff in our lives. There's a time and a place. But just start by doing work in your own life. So go back to the t-shirt. This isn't a defensive piece. Do not judge. Like, step away. Leave me alone. This is a reflective piece. So your t-shirt says, I will not judge. It's reflective. It's meant for me to look at me. One of the interesting things is that Jesus uses this analogy of the eye. And so your eye is so fragile and delicate, isn't it? Like you don't just go poking around and try to get something out of your eye. Like if you've got something in your eye, it is a delicate, careful procedure of getting something out. And so I... Like, Jesus is amazing in his wisdom in saying, Let me, let's use the eye, for example. And, like, just the smallest thing can be a massive irritant in your eye, but it's a delicate thing to get it out. And so what Jesus is talking about is you want to enter into some delicate process of pointing out some sin in somebody's life, and then you're whipping around your beam, like, recklessly. If we're going to speak to an issue in someone else's life, then it needs to be done with sensitivity, compassion, gentleness, love, and genuinely wanting what is best for them. And if you can't do it like that, then don't do it. You're probably not the right person. Because the right person is the one that can do it like that. One last thing here. See, one of the things that we can do as we, we look at these passages is we're like, okay, so basically what I have to figure out is when is the right time to judge people? You probably missed the point if that's what your application is. There are times to speak truth, but Jesus' point is not make sure you know the right time. Jesus' point is, make sure you're the kind of person, not that can speak truth, but that can people receive it from you. So here's a question I want to leave you with. This is a, a hard one. Ready? Is there someone in your life who can speak to you about specs, or beams. Who has permission? The relational bridge. Is there anybody who can speak to you about the specs and the beams in your eye?
because here, here's the thing. I think one of the things Jesus teaches is, so get the beam out of your eye so you can help them with their speck. We need help with the specks. We do. We need people who see things and tell us things and will say, can I, can I just tell you what I'm seeing? It just has to be done in loving, gracious ways. So who do you have in your life that can say, can I tell you about the speck in your eye? Can I just point out the beam that you're swinging around right now? Do you have anybody like that in your life? The whole point Jesus is making here is don't be focused on other people's issues. Like, take care of yours. And then, you know, if we're each taking care of our stuff, then maybe we can have that place where we can talk about, hey, here's what I see. Here's what I see. But it starts with an honest assessment about me. So I, I don't know if you noticed it. So I noticed it in preparing the sermon like, oh, we could do a couple weeks on this one. <laughs> like we, we squeezed David and Goliath into four weeks. We could probably get six out of this. <laughs> like, like there's a lot here. Because this is who we are, and this is what we do, and this is why Jesus is saying, be careful, watch out, don't judge one another. Like the way you approach people is the way it comes back. So here's what that means. If you're harsh in your judgment, how many are like shocked that you just got blasted back? That when you yell something at somebody and say, here's what your ears going on in your life, here's your junk, and then they shout back at you. Like the way you did it is the way it comes back so often, right? And so Jesus is saying, so start with the way you do it. And let's go from there. There's a place for judging, to make decisions, to share the truth. But it all starts with a place of honesty. And from that humble honesty, an expression of grace toward other people. And if you're not there yet, then just start with the first line. Just don't judge. Work on the other stuff. Maybe someday you can be a voice for certain people to talk about certain things, but you may not be that voice for a lot of people. Lots of room for honest reflection here. Here's what I want us to do. Okay. We'll, we'll pass on the closing song. I had a feeling I was going long today. But I, I wanted us to, to take the time and get this all in because I think this is an important one. Like I said, I think people outside the church say, oh, man, they got to work on that. But we don't talk about it enough. And so I wanted us to take time to really take this in and be like, man, we, we got some work to do here. And so here's what I want to do. I want to just give you a minute. And I want you to consider not who needs your judgment, but two things. One, what, what's an area of your life that might be a speck that needs your attention right now? And then two, is there someone that can help you graciously with that? to be the outside voice, to say, here's what I see. So just take a minute. You can bow your heads. You can close your eyes. The first question, is there something, a speck, an issue that the Spirit is highlighting for me this morning? And then two, is there someone who might be a person who can help me with that? Those are your two things. Take a minute, and then I'm going to close us in prayer.